Okay, this is a lecture for section 8.3, polar form of complex numbers. All right, um, let's start with a review of the imaginary number. All right, it's the most basic complex number. And the definition of the imaginary number is that it is equal to the square root of negative one. All right. Um, the imaginary number is important because if we want to do calculations, we want to do calculations with ra uh, negative radicands of even roots, well, that's, that's not a real thing. We can't do calculations with it. The imaginary number allows us to do that. All right. So um, recall the definition of i is the square root of negative 1. All right. So then if we want to simplify the square root of negative 25, we could rewrite that as the square root of negative 1 times 25, right? And uh, then we could write that as the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 25. And then we make that substitution for i, since that's equal to the square root of negative 1. We could write this as i times, of course, the square root of 25 is 5. Or to make that a little bit prettier, we would call that 5i. All right? We typically don't go through all these steps, though, when we're simplifying um, negative radicands of, of even roots. Um, the shortcut is that we can pop an I out front and negative sign. This is the reason why we do that. So I could write this as I square roots of 18. And then the square root of 18 would simplify, of course, into um, I times, let's see, 18 is 9 times 2. So 3 square roots of 2, or I might write that as 3I times the square root of 2. All right. Okay. Um, so a complex number is a number that takes the form a plus bi, where a is the real portion of a complex number, um, and bi is the imaginary portion. Right. Um, complex numbers must take this form. Right. They must have the real part first, then the imaginary part second. So let's get some examples of dealing with uh, maybe arithmetic on complex numbers. Okay, if we want to add two complex numbers, we're simply going to add the real parts, right? And then add um, the imaginary parts. So negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1, right? And the imaginary parts here are negative 4 and positive 6i. Well, negative 4 plus 6 is positive 2i, all right? If we want to subtract complex numbers, we're just going to subtract the, the real parts and then subtract the imaginary parts. Or the way I like to do it is I like to distribute that negative sign and then just write this as if I were adding them. So negative 3 and then a negative of 2i, negative 2i, and then just add the imaginary part or the real part. Sorry, 2 minus 3 is negative 1 and then add the imaginary parts, negative 3i minus 2i is going to be negative 5i. Right. If we're multiplying, right, here we've got, let's look at this one up here first. If we're multiplying um, a complex number with uh, just a real number, right, what we're doing is actually distributing the 8 here, right? So 8 times negative 2 would be negative 16. I did something wrong here. That's not supposed to have a comma in it. It's just minus. Let me fix that. All right. So um, negative 2 times 8 is negative 16. And then 4i times 8 is plus 32i. OK. Now let's come back to this one. Here, I'm going to multiply a complex number that has both a real and an imaginary part with a complex number that only has an imaginary part. Right? Easiest way to think about this, same thing, let's just distribute that 3i, right? So this then will become 5 times 3i, or 15i, and then negative 2i times 3i would be negative 6i squared, right? So I perform that multiplication there just fine, but that is not a complex number. Complex numbers need to have the form a plus bi, where a is real 
and VI is imaginary. That's not what's going on there, right? In fact, there's an I squared involved. We can't have that at all. But since I, by definition, is the square root of negative 1, right? If we square both sides, then I squared is equal to negative 1, right? So we can always make that substitution whenever we have an I squared. We can just substitute negative 1 in for I squared. And I could write this as 15I minus 6 times negative 1 which of course would be 15i plus 6. That's still not quite right though, because look, we have to have the real part first, the imaginary part second. So I would need to switch the order there and call this 6 plus 15i. Okay. Uh, now if I'm, imag if I'm multiplying two complex numbers that both have real parts and imaginary parts, I just want to make sure that I multiply every term with every term, right? So this would be like foiling binomials, right? So I want to multiply the first term with the first term. That was weird. Let's try that again. The first term with the first term. So negative 1 times negative 2 is positive 2. First term with the last term, negative 1 times 3i is negative 3i. Then multiply these inner terms. 2i times negative 2, that's minus 4. I. And then finally, these last terms, negative 2i is positive 3i. That's going to be positive 6i squared. All right. Now, I've performed all that multiplication. I need to rearrange that and put that in the right form. All right. So what can I do here? Well, I've got i squared of equal to negative 1, so I can make that substitution. I can also combine these like terms. Right. So um, this is then 2 minus 7i plus 6 times negative 1 or minus 6. Well, the 2 and the negative 6 can be combined, and this would then be negative 4 minus 7i. Right. Now look at this last one here. Do you recognize that pattern that, that may have? These are actually conjugates. When I multiply these two complex numbers together, the middle term is going to add out, right? This is kind of like an x plus 2 times an x minus 2. Let's do it. Let's see what happens. 3 times 3, that's 9. 3 times negative 4i, that's negative 12i. 3 times positive 4i, that's positive 12i. Look, these i terms are adding up. And then positive 4i times negative 4i is negative 16i squared. Right? So I can now substitute that i squared for negative 1. This always blows me away. And this will become 9 minus 16 times negative 1, which, of course, is 9 plus 16, or 25. So why does this blow me away? This blows me away that we can multiply uh, complex numbers with imaginary parts in them and end up with a real number. I just I don't like to wrap my mind. I, I just have a hard time wrapping my mind around that. Anyway, that can happen, and this is a very nice lead-in to dividing complex numbers, or I kind of think about this as um, rationalizing, or, or not rationalizing, it's like rationalizing the denominator, but um, making the denominator something that can actually uh, be used in division, right? We can't actually divide by an imaginary number. That's in the same category as dividing by zero. So what I've got to do is I've got to multiply this by some type of fancy one, if you will, so that I no longer have i in the denominator, right? And the thing I want to multiply by, multiply by is the conjugate. So if I multiply this by the conjugate over the conjugate, that's going to be 2 plus i over 2 plus i, right? Just change this line there. When I multiply these denominators out, that middle term, it's going to be the i term, and it's going to add out, and I'll no longer have i in the denominator. All right, well, let's perform the multiplication here. <coughs> Excuse me, 3 times 2 is 6. Let's do the numerator first. So 3 times 2 is 6. 3 times i is 3i. 4i times 2 is 8i. And then 4i times i is 4i squared. All right, let's simplify that numerator before we go to the denominator. <coughs> Since i squared is negative 1. We have 4 minus, or I'm sorry, 6 minus 4, or 2, and then their i's will be 3i plus 8i, 11i. Now let's do the denominator. When we multiply these out, 
2 times 2 is 4. 2 times i is positive 2i. 2 times negative i is minus 2i. And the negative i times positive i is negative i squared. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So when we simplify, the i terms add out in that denominator. i squared, of course, is negative 1. So this becomes 4 minus negative 1, or 4 plus 1, 5. All right. So, um... Yeah, I can make that a little bit prettier since, you know, complex numbers should be in this form. Let me break this up. This is then going to be 2 fifths plus 11 fifths i. Okay. Let's try it one more time. This next one down here, 2 minus 5i over 6 plus 7i, I want to multiply by the conjugate of the denominator over the conjugate of the denominator, right? So that'll be 6 minus 7i over 6 minus 7i, right? Let's do that numerator first. 2 times 6 is 12. 2 times negative 7i is negative 14i. Negative 5i times 6 is negative 30i. And then negative 5i times negative 7i is positive 35i squared. All right, let's go ahead and simplify that numerator further. Let's see, i squared is negative 1, so that makes it negative 35 plus 12, so that's what, negative 23? Okay. Um, and then negative 14i minus 30i could be minus 44i. Okay, so there's my numerator. And then the denominator, so we know the i term is going to add out. 6 times 6 is 36. Then we have a negative 42i and a positive 42i and a negative 49i squared. These guys add out. The negative 49 becomes positive 49. 36 plus 49 is 85. We break those out. We have negative 23 over 85 minus 44 over 85i. And those fractions do not simplify. All right. Well, what about this last one? In this last one here, the denominator is just one term, right? one term. So what's the conjugate of that? Well, there's no conjugate there, but all I need to do is get i out of the denominator. So I could just multiply this by i over i, right? Okay, so then my numerator would have 1i plus 2i squared. When I simplify that, that 2i squared is negative 2 plus i. And then the denominator is just 3i squared, right? i squared is negative 1, so that's negative 3. So we break that up. Negative 2 over negative 3 is 2 thirds minus 1 third i. All right? So this is a very, very quick review of complex numbers. I know you've learned that before. Um, but now that we've done that review, let's talk about the complex plane, right? So we, 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 we've worked quite a bit with the Cartesian plane, that's the rectangular coordinate system. Um, and then recently, we've been working with the polar plane, or the polar coordinate system. Well, here's a plane, the complex plane, right, which is how we could plot, plot, we can plot complex numbers, right? In the complex plane, the horizontal axis is the real part of the complex number. And the imaginary or the vertical axis is the imaginary part of the complex number. So if I were to plot the point 3 plus 2i or that, that complex number 3 plus 2i um, in the complex plane, I would move right 3 because it's a positive 3 on the real axis and then up 2 um, because it's positive 2i on the imaginary axis, right? Plot a few more here if I want to plot 4 minus 2i, the real part is 4, so I go to the right 4, and the imaginary part is negative 2, so I go down 2, and there is the complex number 4 minus 2i plotted in the complex plane. Okay, uh, let's see, how about 3 plus, negative 3 plus 5i? Okay, start the origin, negative 3 on the real, positive 5 on the imaginary, and there's the point, negative 3 plus 5i. 
what else do we have there? Uh, negative two. Oh, that's interesting. There's no imaginary part. So we just we would just uh, plot that on the um, <clears throat> on the real axis. Right? The value of negative two. We could think about negative two, right, as negative two plus zero i. <coughs> it's kind of silly to write that zero i. We don't need it. How about 4i? That has no real part, right? Um, if it has no real part, um, that's kind of like 0 plus 4i, right? So there's no, no horizontal component here, just vertical. I would go up to 4. It would be this point right here, 4i. All right, lastly, 4 plus 6i, 4 on the real, 6 up here. Okay. So plotting points in the complex plane. All right. Um, <clears throat> so all of this is just leading into the polar form of complex numbers, right? Um, and then we're going to look at Euler's formula, which is a useful way of um, dealing with the polar form of complex numbers. All right. So if a complex number is A plus bi, we can think about the real part as r times the cosine of theta and the imaginary part as i times r sine of theta, right? Because of the um, complex plane, right? A is the real part, that's the horizontal part, right? Um, and then, and, that, and x is our horizontals in the rectangular coordinate system, right? And then um, the imaginary part is vertical, right? So the sine of that angle is going to be the vertical component for us here, All right? So Euler's, so this is uh, the A plus BI form, polar form for a complex number, right? The alternate form that we use more often is given by Euler's formula, right? And Euler's formula says that this R cosine theta plus I R sine theta is equal to R times E to the I theta, right? So just like if we want to plot a point in the polar coordinate system, we need to find r and theta if we want to find the polar form of a complex number. All right, let's look at some examples. I'll write the following numbers in polar form. All right, here's our form r e i e to the i times theta. Okay, and my complex number here was well, a real part, no imaginary, so it's like 6 plus 0 i. So what I want to do, we start by plotting, looking at that, how that point would plot, how that point would plot in the uh, complex plane. <coughs> six plus zero i. So we have a real component of six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Right, no imaginary component. So the point is right there. All right. So how can we find r and how can we find theta? Well, if we think about the polar coordinates system on top of this, we would have, you know, six circles, right? So R is going to be six. What is theta going to be? Well, there's no angle that's made since this is on the horizontal axis. So theta here is going to be zero. All right. So to write the polar form of 6 plus 0 i, it's simply going to be r, that's 6, times e to the i times theta, but theta is 0, right? And what is e to the i times 0? That's e to the 0 power. Anything to the 0 power is just 1. So it turns out that the polar form of the complex number 6 is just 6. <laughs> okay, but let's look at one that's a little more interesting. Negative, whoops. Where that came from. Get that away. Negative 3 plus 3i. Well, let's begin by plotting it. All right, negative 3. So on the real, we go left 3 and then up 3. So there's our point, right? Negative 3 plus 3i. Okay, to find theta and r, r is going to be the length. Right? If I make a triangle, it's going to be the length of the hypotenuse. Right, But the theta that I want, it's got to be this positive angle here. It's got to be this positive angle here. Um, 
uh, it's going to be greater than pi over 2, okay? So um, to find that theta, though, we're going to need to drop a perpendicular, make a triangle, right? make a triangle, and we'll find this angle here with that right triangle, okay? And then subtract it from pi to get the big angle that we really want. Okay, call him theta sub 2, call this little angle here theta sub 1. Let's find theta sub 1 first. All right, so we can sine, cosine, or tangent to find that angle, couldn't we? Um, but we also need to know r, the hypotenuse, where we want to start. It doesn't really matter. Um, remember that the hypotenuse squared is equal to the leg squared um, plus the leg squared, the square. And so we could then say, remember this relationship? All right, x squared plus y squared. So we could then say that the hypotenuse or that r is going to be the square root of x squared plus y squared, right? Do we know the x and the y? We do, we do. We know the real part and the imaginary part. Um, the real part here was negative 3. The imaginary part was positive 3, right? So that means the length of that leg is 3 and the length of that leg is 3, right? So to find r here, it's just going to be the square root of negative 3 squared plus 3 squared, right, which is the square root of 18. And that'll simplify. Let's see, 9 times 2, that's 3 squared. So 3 square roots of 2. That'll simplify to 3 square roots of 2. So there's our r. Now, how do we find our theta? Well, I think the tangent's probably the easiest way because we know. <coughs> but you know what? Honestly, Let's use cosine because cosine is restricted to quadrants one and two. So it'll give me the it'll give me the angle measure that I'm actually looking for here, and I don't really have to find. That's an easier route to take. Let me change my mind. We don't have to find that little angle, okay? If we use cosine, right? So I can say now that. Oh no, it isn't going to be the right thing. I am going to have to find it. It'll be fine. Opposite, opposite over hypotenuse is going to be, um, or I'm sorry, adjacent over hypotenuse is going to be our cosine, right? So the cosine of theta is going to be negative three over the hypotenuse. We just found that that's three square roots of two. So then theta, it's going to follow that theta is the inverse cosine of negative 3 over 3 square roots of 2. All right, let's see what that is. Inverse cosine of negative 3 divided by 3 square roots of 2. I'm going to close that. Yeah, all right. It's 130. Oh, we are not in radian mode. This is in degree mode. Let's switch over to radian mode for this. I want my angle measure to be a radian. Now let's try that again. There's our radians, 2.3562. Okay. Now I also could have used the tangent and found this little angle here. That was my initial thought. But then I would have had to subtract it from 1.8. I thought it was easier just to go ahead and use the cosine since the inverse cosine would be restricted to quadrants one and two, and we're working over here in quadrant two. All right, so now that I know that, <clears throat> I can write this. It's r, which is three square roots of two, times e to the i times theta. So that's going to be 2.3562i. All right, and there's my answer. Okay, that's the polar form for negative 3 minus 3i. All right, what about this next one? 2 minus 4i. Well, let's see. What does that guy look like? Let's sketch him. In the complex plane. So we go right 2, and we're going to go down 4. There's the point. All right. So to, to find my... Um, theta and r, let's make a right triangle. Let me point over here a little bit. There, that one's better. Let's drop a per put a perpendicular there. 
Okay, so there's a, a right triangle. Um, okay, I know I know the legs of that triangle, right? Because I know my my real portion of the complex number is two, so that leg is two. My imaginary is negative four. Okay, so that's that guy, All right? So finding r, r is going to be the square root of two, two squared plus negative four squared, or what is that? 16 and four, the square root of 20, and that'll reduce to two square roots of five. All right, so there's an r. Now to find that angle, to find theta, what I want is this big guy here. Okay, this time I'm going to have to use two. Oh, when we are in quadrant four, maybe if I use sine, yeah, if I use sine, that's going to give me the right angle. Oh, it's going to be negative, but I could subtract it from two pi to get the big angle, right? Because inverse sine is restricted to quadrants one and four. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. We'll say the sine of theta, okay? And we already have to have a theta sub 1 and a theta sub 2 here. So the sine of this guy <clears throat> is going to be uh, the opposite of the hypotenuse. So that will be negative 4 over that hypotenuse or that radius, which was 2 square roots of 5. Okay. Um, so then... Theta is going to be the inverse sine of negative 4 over 2 square roots of 5. And by the way, you might be thinking, wow, there's another way to do this, right? Um, and there are. There's almost always multiple ways, but we're just, this is just the first thing I thought of, so this is what I'm doing. And let's find out what that is. Okay, inverse sine of negative 4 divided by 2 square roots of 5, and then it's a negative 1.1071, wait, what did I say, 1.1071, yeah, okay, radians, it's negative, of course it's negative because, you know, the inverse signs restricted to quadrants 1 and 4, right, but we want the positive version of that angle. Right, so the positive version of that angle is going to be this big guy, which will be 2 pi minus that negative angle, right? 2 pi minus 1.1071. Now let's see what that is. 2 pi, all right, minus 1.1071. Okay, and it's 5.1761. All right, so that's the angle that we want to write the polar form here. So my polar form is going to be r, what's r again? 2 square roots of 5 times e raised to the i times theta. So theta was 5.1761, so 5.1761i. All right, so that's how we convert. <clears throat> complex numbers into their polar form, all right. Um, why would we ever want to do that? Well, it sure makes calculating um, complex numbers raised to some power easier, right? So if I wanted to calculate 2 plus 2i to the eighth power, well, one thing I could do is multiply 2 plus 2i times itself eight times. But that's a pretty big ordeal, isn't it? It'd be much easier, it would be much easier if I converted this portion to polar form because then I, I wouldn't have two terms and I have to keep multiplying and get this really long polynomial type thing happening, right? Well, if I convert that to polar form first, then I just raise it to the eighth power and I'll have my answer, right? So our polar form, R, go back to that, R e to the i times theta, Right, when we raise that to some power, it's only one term, so it's going to be much easier. All right, so let's see. Let's see if we can do this. Let's convert this to polar form first. 
So we need R, we need theta. Let's sketch that. Uh, let's sketch that or let's plot that point in the polar coordinate system. Um, we're just going to go over to up to, there's our point right there. Actually, let's try that again. Okay. So uh, we'll drop a perpendicular. We'll make a triangle to deal with. If my pen will work, we'll drop a perpendicular. There it goes. Okay. And that's going to be the theta that we need. All right. All right, we know the legs of this triangle, they're two and two, so R won't be far hard to find. R is the square root of two squared plus two squared, square root of eight, which simplifies to two square roots of two. Okay, there's R. Now, theta, well, you might um, recognize that's gotta be uh, pi over four, but if not, right, if not, you could use uh, uh, the tangent to find theta. Right, the tangent of theta, right, that's going to be the opposite over the adjacent, which of course is just one. All right, you might look at the unit circle for that to see that that's pi over four, or you wouldn't have to. You could use the inverse tangent on your calculator, and it'll apply the, it'll 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 reply with the. Um, decimal approximation of pi over 4, but I think I'll use the exact value since we know what that is. All right, so I can now write this in its polar form. To write this in its polar form, this is going to be equal to 2 square roots of 2 times e raised to the i times pi over 4. And then all of that gets raised to the 8th power. Right? All that gets raised to the 8th power. <coughs> so <clears throat> there it is. Now I can simplify. I can calculate this by simplifying a little bit here. Um, this is going to be uh, 2 square roots of 2 to the 8th power times e to the i times pi over 4 to the 8th power. Right? And let's see, what is two, 2 square roots of 2 to the 8th power? That's 2 to the 8th power times the square root of 2 to the 8th power. Let's write that as 2 to the 1 half, right? Square root can be written as 2 to the 1 half to the 8th, eighth power, okay? Times this e to the uh, i pi over 4 to the 8th power. Well, that's going to be e to the 8 pi over 4, right? Or 2 pi i times 2 pi power, okay? I need to simplify this gobbledygook up here a little bit first, right? Uh, 2 to the 8th, right, times 2 to the 1 half to the 8th, that's the 2 to the 8 divided by 4, or 2 to the 4th e, I'm going to write it this way, to the 2 pi i power, all right? 2 to the 8th times 2 to the 4th, that's 2 to the 12th, times e to the 2 pi i power. And what is 2 to the 12th? Uh, what is it, 4,000? Oh, let's see. 2 raised to the 12th power, 4,096. So my value here is 4,096 e to the 2 pi i power. Okay? How about this guy? Uh, square root of negative 4 minus 4i. Well, first I want to rewrite that. Radicals are not our friends here, right? So let's rewrite that as negative 4 minus 4i raised to the 1 half power. Okay? So let me find the polar form, and then we'll raise that whole thing to the 1 half power. So what's our sketch going to look like? Negatives are negative, so we're going to be down in uh, quadrant 3. So there's my I, there's my real axis, uh, left four, down four. There's my point, negative four minus four I. Okay. So theta is this guy here. 
All right, we're going to have to none of our inver and, and we're going to need to find it with um, an inverse function. None of my inverse functions give quadrant three answers, so I'm going to need a theta one and a theta two. The little angle is going to be theta one. The little angle in here is going to be theta one. Okay. All right. I know the legs here. I know my. All right. So r isn't going to be too hard to find. Let's find r. r squared is the square root of negative four squared plus negative four squared. Right. Which is the square root of 32, which simplifies to four square roots of two. Right. 32 is 16 times two. The square root of 16 is four. That's not r squared. That's r. All right. So there's the r. Now theta. Theta. Let's see. Um, we could use tangent. Tangent is going to give us an angle over here that we need to convert. Oh no, an angle up here that we need to convert. All right. So that's fine. So let's use the tangent then. The tangent of theta. Opposite over adjacent, that's negative 4 over negative 4, so that's 1 again. Tangent of theta is 1, all right? So the inverse tangent of that, um, it's going to give us a pi over 4 up here in quadrant 1, right? But we want quadrant 3, right? We want quadrant 3. So theta sub 1 is our pi over 4, but we want quadrant 3, so our theta sub 2, that's going to have to be, see it gave us this angle here. Since these are the same, it's going to be pi plus pi over 4, which is 5 pi over 4. All right, so there's our theta. Okay, so what do we have going on here now? This is going to be um, r. E r was 4 square roots of 2 times e to the i theta, that's i to the i times 5 pi over 4, and then all of this gets raised to the 1 half power. Okay, so, gosh, what are we doing here? Okay, 4 square roots of 2. You know, honestly, I simplified that, and it was a pain. I probably shouldn't. Um, let's put it back. It's going to be easier. Maybe not. Done there. All right, so 4 square roots of 2 to the one half power times e to the i times five over four. So five pi over four times one half, that's gonna be five pi over eight. All right, now four square roots of two to the one half power, that's weird. <coughs> I could write that as four fourth roots of two, or I could just put that as a decimal approximation. Let's see what the decimal is. Four times the square root of 2, and it's an ugly decimal, we'll take the square root of that, because that's, or raise it to the 1 half, either way, let's raise it to the 1 half power, and eh, we'll use the decimal approximation. So this is going to be 2.37841, no, I don't want that many, 2.3784, we'll just use four decimals, times e, to the i, and I'm going to leave uh, 5 pi over 8 as it is. 5 pi over 8. And there's our answer. Woo! Okay. All right, there's one more thing I want to show you in this section. Okay, and that's DeMoff's theorem. Now, DeMoff's theorem is, says, states that a complex number that's written in the form R cosine theta plus i sine theta, or r cosine theta plus i r sine theta, same thing, right? Right. Um, if we raise it to any power, so for any integer n, let's wrap, so let's put it down here. I can then say that that complex number raised to the n power, it's going to be r to the n times cosine n theta plus i sine theta. All right. So this is another way actually a little easier. Right? DeMoff's theorem lets us calculate um, powers of complex numbers. 
and write them in the A plus BI form if we need that. Okay, not polar form, but A plus BI form. All right, so we still need to know a few things. We still need to know R, we still need to know theta, and we need to know N. All right, so for this first example, N, that's the exponent. So we'll say N equals 8. We already calculated R and theta for 2 plus 2i. So let's see what that is. Let's go back and cheat. I want to do that again. 2 plus 2i to R is 2 square roots of 2. Theta was pi over 4. Right? So plugging all this in, then I can say that 2 plus 2i to the 8th power is equal to R to the N. So that's 2 square roots of 2 to the 8th power times the cosine of uh, 8 theta, right, plus i times, oh no, we know theta, I don't want 8 theta, I want to say 8 times pi over 4, right, okay, then plus i times the sine of pi over 4. All right, we can simplify that. 2 square roots of 2 to the 8th power, we already found that. Let's go look and see what that was. 2 square roots of 2 to the 8th power was 4,096. Okay, so this then can become 4,096 times the cosine 8 pi over 4 that's the same, 8 divided by 4 is 2, as 2 pi, right? And the cosine of 2 pi is just 1, right, from the unit circle. Okay, and then the sine of pi over 4, right, here, let me show you. 2 pi is right here at 0, the cosine is 1. <coughs> pi over 4 up here has a sine of 1. <coughs> So this is plus i times 1, or 1i. We distribute that 4,096. Um, our complex number is 4,096 plus 4,096i. So that's the a plus bi form, as opposed to the polar form of 2 plus 2i to the 8th power. We can do the same thing down here. Okay, we don't want that radical, so we rewrite that as negative 4 minus 4i to the 1 half power. Okay, and uh, let's see, so n is 1 half. All right, we already found r and theta. What were they? r was 4 square roots of 2, and theta was 5 pi over 4. So filling these into our formula now, we can say that <coughs> negative 4 minus 4i to the 1 half power is going to be equal to 4 square roots of 2 to the 1 half power times the cosine of 1 half times and theta 5 pi over 4. Right, plus i times the sine of 5 pi over 4. All right, we know what uh, 4 square roots of 2 to the 1 half is. We found that already. It was this 2.3784. Okay. So it's 2.3784 times the cosine, 1 half times 5 pi over 4, that's the cosine of 5 pi over 8. All right, I don't need that. And then plus i, what's the sine of 5 pi over 4? Well, that's from the unit circle, right? Let's go look at that for a minute. Um, if, I can get, if I can find it, I have a unit circle up here somewhere. I thought I did. It's too small to see. There's one. 
from the unit circle, look, 5 pi over 4 is here, right? So the sine is negative uh, square root 2 over 2. All right, so this is i times, well, let's do it this way, negative square root 2 over 2 i. Okay? Let's simplify that a little bit more because we can find out what cosine um, 5 pi over 4 is. Okay, and then we can multiply that by the 2.387. So let's see what it is. The cosine of 5 pi over 4. Calculator fell asleep. There it comes. All right, the cosine of 5 pi over 4 is, or 5 pi over, sorry, 8. It's 5 pi over 8. Cosine of 5 pi over 8 is negative 0.3827. Here, we're going to, okay, and that times 2.3784. There it is. Is negative. 0.9102. Okay, there's our real portion. Now the imaginary portion, we've got it as negative square root 2 over 2. So let's just see what that is. Oh, but I gotta multiply it by the 2.387. 3784. So let's see what that is. So negative square root of 2 divided by 2. Is that now multiply that by the 2.3784? All right, so that imaginary part is whoa, <laughs> come on now, this is silliness. That imaginary part is let me look at that again negative 1.6818. I there we go. So there is the a plus bi form of the square root of negative 4 minus 4i. Four All right. So that ends the lecture for section 8.3.